bug proof the rocket up there, Brandon? No. Where's that spray at? The mosquitoes out here are freaking gnarly. All right. What's up, everybody? <laughs> uh, the mosquitoes out here are freaking horrible, but welcome back to the Summit Bid channel. My name is Brandon Wooler, and today I'm going to be talking about a camera that I've not seen a lot of videos on. In 2022, Canon came out with a weird kind of one-off camera that I think a lot of people overlooked. I have found it to be genuinely a great camera to work with. And I do all types of photography. I do events, I do a lot of portraits, I do product, I do even some sports. And um, with this camera, I do landscapes, which is interesting because it's a $6,000 24 megapixel camera. And I think a lot of people really wrap themselves to try to figure out the mental math to make that kind of work. <laughs> <coughs> Potato! <laughs> Got him! Um, A1. No. A1. 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 <laughs> Shut up, Toby. <laughs> that camera is the Canon R3. Into the black hole. The first category I'm gonna go over is portraits. So for portraits, I give um, the Canon R3 a 4.5 out of five. So there are a few big reasons for this. First off, it has a gripped body, which it's kind of hard to elaborate on this without you holding it, but the grip on this body feels significantly better than the R5 I also have, and the grip that I can put on it, it just doesn't quite feel the same. And then the grip doesn't have to extend as far down. It doesn't extend. And then there's always kind of a weird like seam like it and it never feels like it's like tight enough to me. So maybe there are a couple things I can say on that. Like it just it it doesn't feel like a cohesive unit when you're shooting with an attached grip versus a like, you know, built on grip. That's hard to explain, but then there's also another feature that I will get into in a second, but I want to save it for a different section that makes this grip especially unique but I'm gonna move on to eye autofocus. So the autofocus on this camera is amazing. Also, I'll talk about that more later in the video, but the eye autofocus on this lens or on this camera is amazing. So before this, I had an a7 IV, which ironically is the camera Toby's shooting on, so I feel bad talking straight to my a7 IV. <sighs> Sorry, a7 IV, but the eye autofocus on this like hits basically every time. I don't even have to check if I missed a shot. I basically am confident that the camera got it. So on the a7 IV, I would go in and I would check to make sure that the shot was sharp and hit the eye. And normally the a7 IV was close. Like you would sometimes get it where it focused on the nose or it'd be back focused a little bit, but the R3 pretty much always hits the eye exactly. The other thing that made a big difference is the autofocus on the a7 IV when I was shooting with that was in low light. It would really struggle, especially with eye autofocus, where the um, R3 will always, like it all, It might be a little bit slower than it would be in really good light, but it it's very accurate and still hits. So when I'm shooting in a studio and the um, light is just not as bright around, the flashes are really compensating for everything, the R3 still kind of nails it. And that's been a huge thing for me because I do a decent amount of studio work. So really the only con I can think of is that it's not like a medium format Hasselblad, which that's a good thing because Hasselblads and phase ones are great for studio portrait stuff. Like that'd be awesome. But for everything else and even like shooting out in natural light, Hasselblads and phase ones is they just, they struggle a little bit. Another point I wanted to make is that right now I have the 85-1-2. Beautiful, go. beautiful lens, super crispy. Um, but also at 1.2, that is a hard, small little um, depth of field for a camera to actually get in focus. So I'm going to shoot Toby, who's shooting me right now, <clears throat> at 1.2 and show you kind of the accuracy it has. He's wearing glasses and a hat and has a camera in front of him and we're able to nail focus super quickly. Awesome. And then 
obviously all zoom in on this on the computer, but boom, nailed it on the eye, even with the glasses. So that's one point I wanted to bring up. The other point is it is so easy. So I was shooting this. I have to, so when I'm doing a lot of commercial work, um, especially when the client wants website stuff, they'll have me shoot um, some of it in landscape. So I'll be shooting like this. And then they'll quickly want me to just be like this. And it's very easy for me to just switch between the two. And it's hard to explain why I think that's a big deal. But I autofocus in general has been a big deal for me because when I was shooting with my A7 original way back in the day before I autofocus, the big problem was that um, I had to not, like I had to basically like either focus recompose or be moving the dot around. Didn't even have a joystick and my compositions just weren't as good as when I got the A7R 3 that I got, you know, a year or two after my A7 original. Huge composition change for me. My composition started to look just amazing. I felt like I was just not even have to think where the eye is and it, <clears throat> I'd be able to get like, yeah, basically like I didn't have to move my focus point around. I could focus after my composition was set. The grip has a little bit of that same effect where I don't have to hold it like this, be kind of thinking about my orientation. I can just shoot more freely, less strings attached and that affects my workflow. So I'm not sure if that'll be true for everybody, but for me, that's been a big deal. All right. Okay. So I wanted to start with portraits because that's what I do most of. The mosquitoes out here are getting gnarly, just so everybody knows. Um, but it's gonna be no surprise to everybody that knows about the camera that it gets a five out of five for events and sports. Holy smokes, yeah. I don't know if you guys can see these. <laughs> Isn't that what it was basically designed for? I mean, it is, yeah, that's what. The 30 frames a second, the autofocus, all of that is top of the line and that is what it was made for. That being said, I'd like to go over a few things. So, four events, wow. Oof. Yeah, let's Watch get some. Watch your breath. So, uh, I talked about the eye autofocus with portraits. Well, obviously this camera has amazing autofocus in general, um, but specifically, I wanna talk about um, kind of the ergonomics of it. So, it has three autofocus buttons that um, you can kind of dedicate to certain things. I have one set up for general autofocus, one set up for eye autofocus, and honestly one that I haven't set up yet, but I'm glad I have three, more the merrier. And then the one I've set up for auto, general autofocus is, sorry. Uh, actually something that no other camera has on the market right now. And that's called a smart controller. It's on the AF on button. Holy crap, it's like it's snowing. Mosquitoes. But what this allows you to do is uh, a lot of people will have joysticks on their cameras. That's amazing, love a joystick. But this allows you to basically use like a sensor built into the AF on button to quickly move the um, autofocus point kind of anywhere you want. And it's very intuitive. It takes you a second to get used to it, yes, but um, once you get the hang of it, it's like riding a bike. It's super awesome. And with events and sports, this is huge because there's been plenty of events that I've shot where um, something happened that was very like noteworthy. And if I did not have this, the joystick would have taken way too long to get to it. But the um, smart controller was able to just I was basically able to zip right to it and nail focus and get it. So that's kind of combining the autofocus speed and um, also like the speed of the ergonomics of the camera. Do you ever use like the, the sensor to like move it quickly and then the, the actual joystick to like refine where the focus point is? No, you don't really need to do that. The, I, I'm honestly, the, if one thing sold me this camera, um, it's the smart controller. That thing is a game changer. Um, I don't think you can understand how great it is until you've actually tried it, but it's so fast. It's it's five times faster than the 
um, joystick, if not maybe even a little bit faster than that. So, and that kind of goes into composition once again. So, you know, you kind of, in a pinch, you focus where you have to focus. This kind of allows you to focus where you want to focus. It almost inverts that idea. And that's been a huge thing for me. So with events especially, um, that's amazing. Obviously also with events, you're shooting in a lot of different lighting situations. Uh, I pushed the camera to eight or 12,800 plus ISO and the photos turn out fine. Obviously not ideal. You'd love to have 100 ISO for every shot if you could, but that's not possible when shooting events. And then with 50 megapixels, you can crop, you get more reach out of all your lenses. Yeah, with 50 megapixels, you also get uh, really, really, really horrible noise in your photos. So um, that's awesome. <laughs> also, other side note things, like a lot of cameras have really good in-body image stabilization. I shoot with two lenses that don't have stabilization, so the fact that this camera has amazing in-body stabilization is huge. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it also shoots 30 frames a second, so I got to shoot a Twins game, and that was awesome. I don't know how, like, I was struggling with 30 frames a second, honestly, so I don't know how people used to do it with 12 or on film. <laughs> like, that's insane to me but 30 frames a second you can just motor roll it and you'll be able to get it really close to the bat and with the electronic shutter you get to shoot silent so that's awesome for events especially if you're in a church i've shot a few events in a church and um there's nothing more awkward than coming into a church and having a big clunky shutter sound when everybody's being quiet and you just feel like okay great nobody's giving you dirty looks because nobody would ever do that but you mentioned for portraits, the fact that it still has an electronic shutter can make that pretty loud. Like it's really loud right now. Oh, I, yeah, I always shoot with the electronic shutter. Like how um, is it right now? Let's see. Uh, shutter volume is at three out of five. So here's a, here's a fiver. I will say the weird thing is because it's coming from, like, I'm shooting with the electronic shutter right now. I train models when I, like I'm shooting with them to get in sync with the shutter. So when they hear the shutter sound, it's move on to the next pose. So for me, it's huge to have the shutter be something I have in my camera and a loud shutter in some sort, like some situations is actually really nice. Um, but obviously in other situations, no shutter sound is nice. So it's kind of fun to have both of those. Sure. Shoot it live. We'll shoot it live, everybody. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. All right. Um, you know who that was, who did that? Yeah, what's the guy that just got arrested? Or not just, but... Uh, Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly. Do it live! Here's a... <laughs> Alright. Uh, anyways. <laughs> so, I did want to note one more thing, because I was talking about the grip in the portrait section. So, on the grip, and on... So, you know, shooting in kind of the normal orientation that cameras have. You have this smart controller that I was just showing off in B-roll, or that Toby will show now, not in B-roll. Uh, you also have one on the um, smart or on the uh, grip. So, what happens if you try to use them both at the same time? I've never tried that, but let's see. Oh, they they both work at the same time, and work is a stretch. But <laughs> all right, Toby likes watermelons. Toby likes watermelons. I'd like to talk about product photography. That's another one that's kind of interesting. I give it a 4.5 out of 5, kind of same as portraits. Uh, the big pros are it just has amazing color. Um, it's a really good studio camera, like I was talking about with the autofocus. You can kind of focus in darker situations. So if you're trying to black out the background and you have no lights on, uh, generally speaking, the autofocus does amazing. Uh, I guess a con is again, um, you might want a little crop ability. So if you wanted to get a shot that's like, you know, the full product and then also crop in on a logo or a name or something, that could be helpful. But honestly, still 24 megapixels. It's, it's not like you can't crop that for a website or uh, for social media. Like that's, a, that's plenty for both of those. Um, even if you're putting on a billboard, honestly, like those things are printed at such low quality that, you know, you don't need 24 megapixels for it. They're not using the full 24 megapixels. You're so far away, you don't even see the pixelation. So anyways, um, 
I got Toby here and we're gonna do just a quick little um, uh, tin cup whiskey product shoot. And I'm just gonna show you guys a... Cool. Coral, coral. Also everyone, no mosquitoes here. Yeah, no Not mosquitoes. mosquitoes. This is so much prettier and so much less mosquitoey. So, okay, so anyways, to start off, uh, we shot a little bit of a video. We we're just messing around with shooting a, a faux commercial for tin cup whiskey earlier. But um, I normally would not open a product for a product shoot, like <laughs> crack a whiskey bottle open. But it is a little empty and it might be a little bit dirty, but you'll get the idea. Cool. Oh. No. Oh, that's nice. All right. Hold out for the landscape part, though. All right. So, just quick, quick shot. Show that versatility. Show the versatility. Should I shoot it at one, two? Probably not. All right, everybody. So, we're going to shoot a bottle of tin cup whiskey. We actually, just a little bit ago, shot a video that we were just kind of messing around with the faux commercial that we were thinking about doing for them. Not a sponsor. Um, yeah, yeah, not a sponsor yet. Please, Tin Cup Whiskey, please. Tin <laughs> um, Cup Whiskey or Starbucks or both? Or both. Tin Cup Whiskey. <laughs> um, anyways, so we have a nice kind of mountain view, backlit. I love doing backlit shots with um, these clear bottles. I think it looks great. The colors just... They're gonna pop. So I'm gonna have Toby, I keep seeing these. I saw it actually in the airport on the way here. Somebody did a um, shot of a hand holding a bottle of whiskey and we're gonna emulate that. So Toby, have the logo face me and then let's get some of that backlit Mountain View in there. And kind of the point of this too is more to show you guys the quality and resolution of the camera. So I'm gonna take a shot and then I'm also gonna show you it cropped in so you can kind of get like a a more expanded view of the whole product with an atmosphere, but also kind of a close-up shot of the actual uh, logo slash name. Perfect, Toby. Love that. Slanted a little bit more, maybe. Nice. Twist your arm just a teeny bit more towards me. The tin cup part. Perfect. Slanted a little bit more, maybe. Love that. All right, awesome, cool. So, I thought I was gonna be a friend. No, we're not sharing. Okay, so um, now we're gonna shoot this Patagonia V1 LT, we said, was that the name of it? Something like that. Sorry. All right, so, Skeeters are back also. So we're gonna shoot this uh, coat from Patagonia. And in true Patagonia fashion, I'm going to try to get Toby out here in the wilderness. Um, I'm going to shoot at f2.2 on the 85.12 from Canon RF. And then, um, yeah, this is kind of mainly what I actually do. One of my big, like, professional things is I shoot a lot of products. So I'm going to have Toby wear the backpack with the Patagonia jacket so it looks more kind of Patagonia fashion of actually being outdoorsy and prepared. Um, but then I'm also gonna have him take it off to get a little bit more e-commerce images. So- And um, we are running out of time, yep. so we are gonna, we're just gonna go jump right in. Down, and then let's take a couple shots. I'm not gonna go too in depth, but I'm just gonna give you guys you a like little bit of a preview. Shot. Okay, so now we are to probably what people care about the most, uh, the landscape portion of this um, R3. Not really review, but my experience with the R3. So for landscape, the R3 is amazing for a few different reasons. Um, it is very, very durable and weather sealed. So first off, a lot of cameras are now getting this, but it has a shutter shield. So that is huge so when you're out in the field if it's windy if it's dusty obviously not ideal regardless but you have a shutter shield i'm standing out here on top of a mountain and i'm okay just having my you know 
camera open and I'm about to put my lens on because I was changing from the 85 to the um, 28 to 70, but not worried as I should have shielded. And it also cleans in between every time you turn it off and on. So we're gonna put that on. And then I'm gonna get set up real quick, but I'll be back to tell you a little bit more. All right. To be honest, the R3 is a 24 megapixel camera. And I think that's fine. I think a lot of photography has been done with 24 megapixel cameras and landscapes especially. I think there are a few people when we were in Jackson Hole, I will double check this, but I, they shot with um, like D6s and you know 5D Mark III's and obviously those are amazing uh, cameras and probably don't even have the same like updated sensors that the R3 has. I guess to state the scale, I think Z's get degrees. The R3 definitely is able to do landscape photography, so I'm gonna give it a 3.5, which is the lowest score of all of the things it does. And what are the exact reasons for it getting the lowest score? So, it does have a weird form factor. So, bringing a gripped body into the um, wilderness is hard. It's hard to pack it. I think megapixels is a big one. Megapixels, 24 megapixels is 24 megapixels. There's good and bad with that, as I've said. Uh, actually, it will have better uh, noise reduction or noise capabilities with long exposures, but still 24 megapixels, so that's one. Um, like I just said, the form factor, it is a big body. It is one point, or no, sorry, it is 2.2 pounds compared to the R5, that's 1.6 pounds. So if you bring just an R5, no grip, you are saving a little over a half a pound. Um, and then I just... Oh yeah, $6,000. If you only do landscape photography, maybe not your camera. If you do all the types of photography, definitely your camera. I guess, you know, I was trying to section everything off, but R3 is an incredible video camera. It shoots 6K 60 raw, so 12-bit. Um, it shoots everything else in 10-bit. You have um, 4K 120, uh, 1080 240, and um, you know, image stabilization, it does come with a couple of cons. You do get the Canon wobble, so that's not great if you're using a really wide angle lens, but you know, I have a 28 to 70, which it does pretty well with not having, like it doesn't quite get wide enough for the Canon wobble to really take effect. So yeah, um, otherwise also some side notes, great battery life. That's a pro for a lot of things I've talked about has a really nice back screen. So if you're somebody who likes to, you know, even when doing landscape, if you like to look at the back screen, um, it gives you a great- Great uh, tripod experience. Yeah, great tripod. Uh, back screen viewing. Comes with a tilty flippy screen, which I love, so. How's the uh, back screen compared to the a7 IV? <laughs> well, the a7 IV has a cracked back screen right now that we have, so that's its own problem, but. Um, it's way better. Both viewfinder and back LCD are incredibly better. Like I can't, I can't even, I don't even know how to put it into words. Obviously I could list off the, you know, dots and whatnot, but. I think perception matters a lot. Yeah. Like it, how sharp they feel. Yeah, when looking through the viewfinder, it almost feels 3D. Like you feel like you're looking into the scene. With the a7 IV, the a7R III, a7 original, uh, which were my previous mirrorless cameras. It did the job, like it wasn't horrible. I mean, the A7 original might've been horrible, but the other two were fine, but it just wasn't like, it doesn't, you don't feel like integrated into the scene that you're shooting. With this, you feel like you're a part of the scene. So I think that's a big deal. I feel like a big thing that this camera does generally is it kind of cuts down boundaries. Like I was saying with the, um, smart controller it you can compose way quicker how you want to it becomes second nature the viewfinder like i was just saying you feel like you're a part of the scene it integrates you into the scene the eye autofocus which isn't like it's not new to the canon r3 but it is especially good in the canon r3 that really just helps you um with composition also you don't have to think about it you don't have to worry you have the confidence that it's going to hit pretty much every time. I would say 99 out of 100, but yeah. 
So I think that's it for this video. Um, I'll pop up some landscape photos if I didn't already. And um, if you found it interesting, helpful, all of the above, uh, please like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next adventure.